My name's DJ Zinc. I've been making music for around 28 years. When I first started making music, the barrier to entry was somewhere up there. It was just so far out of my reach that it took me years and years and years to get to a point where I could even start making music. Since then, the technology's changed so much that all you need really is a laptop, a pair of headphones, and a good idea. So today, I'm gonna to explain a little bit about my creative process. Uh, I'm gonna talk about what inspires me. I'm gonna talk about some of the experiences I've had over the years. And of course, I'm gonna be telling you about how to process a break beat. So, as the YouTubers say, Let's jump in. Break beats. I love break beats. I'm sure you love break beats too. Maybe not as much as me, but there are loads of break beats, some really famous ones. And uh, when I first got into making music, I had like one or two that I sampled from other rave tracks where they just left the drums on their own because back then you couldn't just Google breakbeats and up comes a list. I, I lived in East London, I didn't know anyone that knew anything about breakbeats. So after making music for a few years, I found out about a series of compilations called Ultimate Breaks and Beats, legendary series. This compilation was tracks that had breakbeats in them, some bars of drums on their own. And so I just bought the whole series of compilations and was just gassed. So it was always about the breakbeats. I released a track maybe three weeks ago and it featured a breakbeat, this breakbeat, which is called Call Is Back. This is a great breakbeat. That's what it sounds like. It sounds great as it is. One of the things that I love about breakbeats is that you're bringing a piece of this sound from way back, 1971 in this case, and you're bringing it into the present and making new music with it. And so this breakbeat is a piece, it's like a piece of someone's soul for me. So the way that I would treat this breakbeat is really similar to how I would have done when I first started in 1993, when I got an Akai S950, which is this great big clunky bit of equipment, which had a small screen and you had to do everything just by reading the numbers on the screen. It was really uh, hard, hard work. You had to be really committed. Now it's much easier because you have the software that has this big visual display and lets you see what the drum break looks like. It gives you a visual representation of the sound. The way I would treat it though is actually really similar to what I would have done 28 years ago or whatever it is. And that is to chop the break beat up into individual slices and put them into a, into a sampler and replay them at a higher speed. The software nowadays allows you to do that um, using algorithms to time stretch drums, but I don't really like the way it sounds or does it. And I've, I've tried it with loads of different versions because it's pretty slow the way I, I do it, but it just doesn't sound so good. So this is, if you use the algorithms, you can then, that's how the break beat is without any processing or without any time adjustment. But if you made the BPM 174, like you would for a drum bass track, the drum sounds okay, but it doesn't sound great. It's lost a little bit of the clarity. And you can change it. It's got different um, algorithms that sound different. But none of them, none of them sound great. If you re-pitch, it will sound a bit like a jungle record. Because a lot of what we were doing back in the day in 1993, we were not always chopping every single breakbeat into every single slice of the, the drums. We were um, sometimes taking half of the breakbeat and or up to the snare and then from the snare. And so we were speeding, speeding stuff up. So that's why a lot of drum and bass uh, or jungle back in the day had this pitched up sound to it. What I would do nowadays is similar to what I would have done in the old days. And that is to chop the breakbeat into individual elements. So that's each kick, each snare, each hi-hat. I've chopped these into each individual part. For example, if I just played that one hit on its own, you would just hear a snare. Play that there. So I take those individual bits and put them into a sampler. One of the things that samplers are really cool for is that as you play the sound up the keyboard, it plays it faster. And for, for a lot of people, that would not be desirable. But for me, it's, it has a sort of a 
really nostalgic feel to it. But it's, it's also like a sort of creative tool to play the sample faster as you play up the keys. That's what it looks like. So you can see this is a, a keyboard representation. So if I solo that one, it sounds a bit stuttery. Uh, and if I change the speed to faster, faster, but it hasn't changed. It has to go much faster to fit sound good. So what I would do at this point then is rearrange the kicks and snares to a way that I like. So purists might say that you lose the groove of the breakbeat, but it's the way I learn, and I, I really like to have more uniform sound and for the breakbeats to sound. Uh, it, it's more controlled. Um, also, I've got a shortcut set up on this software that does something called legato, which means each part will only go up to the next, the start of the next part. So if I hit that, you'll see that they, they, they shorten up. And then there's something in it that I don't like, which is that one. And that, so I just chose a slightly cleaner hi-hat. And that to me sounds good. Um, I would, of course, make it blue in colour because drums are always blue. Depending on who you are though, different engineers, some engineers will have green drums and will say, your drums are blue, what's the matter with you, you know, so. Um, so now, now when we're looking in, in, in this part of the screen, you can see the keyboard up the side, this is, um, this part here is shown in, in this part here. So I'll click on that one uh, and that is soloed. I've now rearranged the breakbeats into um, using the kick and snare that I like. And I can change the BPM of the track. It sounds, it sounds nearly perfect there. But as I go faster, that's at 140 BPM. That sounds really clean. I can change it to 175 BPM, 174. It sounds really clean. It sounds much better than the algorithm version. I think I'll try and find the algorithm one and play that. If I put that on the stretch, it sounds all right, but it doesn't sound great. Whereas that sample version sounds great. Some of you might be listening to this and thinking, actually, that sounds just the same, but it's definitely not the same. Um, so, that is a breakbeat chopped up into a, into a sampler and I've chosen the kicks and snares that I like. I've arranged them into a pattern that I like. Actually, I think I would arrange that so that the, so it was more like a typical drum and bass or jungle pattern and I'll do that by going like that and then like And then I'll get rid of these ones. That now sounds like typical drum and bass, um, or you can slow it down to 138 BPM, which is where I used to live. And it sounds great there, but I could have done this in 1993. But what I can do nowadays is I'd split that breakbeat into the kicks, the snares, and the percussion. And the reason I would do that is because I want the kicks to sound a certain way, the snares to sound a certain way, and the percussion to sound a certain way. Slightly different. And so I have prepared this already. So I've got three versions. This one is just the kicks. This one is just the snares. This is the percussion. And what I've added to the percussion is an EQ. If I click on this button here, it will show you the EQs that I've got in my laptop. Admittedly, I do spend quite a bit of money on plugins, but what I've learned about this along the way is that it's almost completely a waste of money and that some of them just look a bit different, but essentially they do the same thing. And I've seen people that make music using stock plugins, using the very basic plugins on Ableton, Bitwig, Logic, Fruity Loops that are making songs that are, you know, however you measure it, people are making very, very successful and popular music without having to buy all these plugins. 
but I think I'm, I've got a mild addiction problem and, yeah, you know, it, it, it makes me happy. Could be worse, couldn't it? Let's be honest. Um, but I'm going to use the basic plugin that comes with this software. This is Bitwig I'm using. So this is the basic plug, the basic EQ plugin, and I've taken the bass part out of the percussion part. So that's the bit that sounds like this. If I put that EQ on the whole break, right, and then... So you can see now as I move that up, and if I turn the solo off, see it sounds really tinny. That sounds really bassy. Well, the, the bass is there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the bass out of the hi-hat parts because if you had a hi-hat, generally you wouldn't want to hear the bass. And these samples have come from vinyl recordings. And so inevitably you get the vinyl rumble, you get some bits and pieces. So this is a really nice way to be able to take out the parts of the sample that are not pure and not exactly what you want to hear. So I'm going to EQ just the more percussive parts. So you can't really hear it, it doesn't sound that different, but I think that once you get to this stage of uh, working with a breakbeat, the stuff you're going to do is really subtle, but it's just to make it sound sharper, cleaner, nicer. So I've done that and I'm going to add transient control. If I put the transient control on the whole break, it becomes easier to hear. If I go like that, you can hear it's really snappy. If I go like that, it becomes really full. So what I would do is I'd add the snappy I'd make the percussion snappier. Uh, the reason I would do that is because I just want the breakbeat to sound clean and sharp. So that's pretty much it. The other thing that I would then do is maybe add an EQ or some sort of process into the overall break and you could use something like a multi-band compressor, you could use an EQ, I could use, let's, let's, let's get one of, the, uh, one of the EQs out for the, for the nerds like me, this is a plug-in version of the Poltec EQ and I'm gonna turn up the treble. So if you're under 20 that probably hurts, but if you're like me it sounds good. <laughs> so I've added some treble to the overall break now and, um, and by putting it through a plug-in like this, by putting the whole thing back together through a plugin like this, it kind of gives it um, a gel, a cohesion. The next thing I'll do to this breakbeat to make it sound better is to add a kick and a snare underneath the kick and snare that are already there. The thing behind that for me is that a lot of the modern music that I listen to is made using kicks and snares from sample packs and drum machines that sound really sonically very, very good, very strong, very powerful. And so in order to make the music I'm making sound modern, but also have the, have the, the sort of nostalgic or the, the old school breakbeat feel, I add kicks and snares, so I layer them underneath uh, the breakbeat. So I've got some kicks that I have uh, put in my laptop before, and I would put them in the right place, and then choose one that is kind of in keeping with the breakbeat. Like that one, for example. So, I can't really hear that until I turn it off. And that's kind of the idea. What I want to do is I just want to layer kick and snare in there to uh, I think that whoever's watching this right now, I think they've got a better vocab than me. And they're saying, well, a supplement, of course. Or, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever word you want to use, as long as you don't say, fuck it up. Uh, and then I'd add a snare like this. I mean, that snare on its own, listen to that, it sounds like something from, I don't know where, but if I put that in now, it doesn't really sound any different. But if you turn that off, it just sound, it doesn't sound quite as full, quite as sharp, quite as powerful. And then what I would do to that, this one's for the super nerds, is I would put a little bit of sidechain compression on the brake beat, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna tell the compressor every time these new kick and snares hit, just turn down the volume just slightly. 
and then that way the, uh, the support in kicks and snares will cut through a little bit more. And you, it's really hard to hear, I'll make it really apparent actually, just so you can hear. You can hear there, right? That's really apparent, but that's not how I would have it. I would have it like, like that. And you can hardly hear it. But again, it's one of those things that when you turn it off, you can hear it. And it just makes the transients cleaner and it means that the, the drum break will sound really clean, really, um, it sounds how I want it to sound. It might not sound how you want it to sound, but it sounds how I want it to sound. The other thing that I did that I forgot to mention is I pitched them up slightly because I wanted it to sound like a bit like jungle. So I pitched the individual things up. In doing it that way, it preserves the transients and it kind of, for me, it keeps the sound a bit, a bit more close to the original. And then I added some kicks and snares. Now it sounds great. Uh, you could change, it, change the BPM. One of the great things about the samplers is that you can change the BPM and it still sounds clean, sounds great. And that's it. That's how I get a break beat from 1971 and uh, make it sound how I want it to sound in 2021. Six percent. <laughs> I was starting to, uh, I was starting to shake. <laughs> start a track there's kind of uh, there's, there's two places that I draw from and it's in and one of them is what would I want to hear if I turn the radio on or what would I want to hear if I walked into the club I'm really lucky that I don't really get creative blocks you know I love making music and there is if I could you know there's ten things I could think oh it'd be great to make a track that did this or that did that or that reminded me of this or that and once you start seeing those things, it's like there's just not enough in hours in a day because there's so many things that you could do that are, that are fun. If I was just starting out as a producer now, what I would do is I'd find five tracks that I really like and try to completely remake them. And then I wouldn't do the then tempting thing and change them slightly and release them. I would trash them, but I would learn in that process how that person had made that music. The lack of YouTube was good for me in as much as somebody like Dillinger would make a track and he would do this thing in it and I think, how the hell did he do that? And so I would then be trying all these different things to try and make a sound like that and I would not get the same sound, but I would get a new sound. <laughs> Something that I do that is not something that comes with experience or time or anything, I'm aware of what appeals to me in music. It's worth paying attention to what actually moves you personally. And I think that then you're able to use that to, for inspiration. I think if you're making dance music, it's, you, you can kind of test it on yourself. And if it's not making you get up and dance, then, I'm, then maybe you're not hitting the spot for yourself. You know, I'm in the studio, I'm glad there's not a camera in there because at least once a day I'm standing up, I'm dancing, I'm not very good at dancing, so, but I still am getting down. Part of the process of making music is releasing the music. So when I speak to some people sometimes who don't release the music they make, I feel like they're missing out on part of the the, the, the joy of it and it's like kind of closing a loop when you release a track. Yeah, so I've read somewhere that a lot of successful musicians have a combination of this sort of delusional belief about their tracks and a sense of urgency and so every track I do, pretty much, I listen to it and I think this could be really big and then, and then about 98% of them are not. But the, the one I'm working on at the minute, the one I finished yesterday, when you hear it, I think, I think, I really think that the 
the, it's a bit different from what you've heard before. I think you're gonna like it. It's true though, it's true. I really do. I, every, every, almost every track. I think oh, this one is, you know, <laughs> and then they never do. You know. <laughs> You know, my studio, I've got really nice speakers. I've got these vintage keyboards. I've got, uh, you know, I've got rack mounts of equipment. And what I've realized is that some of the best tracks I've made, I make on my laptop with a pair of headphones. And that's it. I, I got this software to, today that means you put your headphones on and it modifies the sound so you, it's the same as if you are in a particular studio. And it works with all different headphones. So they know how, you know, how III headphones sound. They know how head headphones sound. They, and they apply this technology that means it sounds like you're in a certain studio somewhere. And that's just incredible. You know, in the old days, it was so hard for Super Sharp Shooter, for example. But every single sound in that track, I'm talking about every hi-hat, every snare, I had to write in a bit of code. And then the numbers go down the screen. It's a bit like the Matrix. You just had to be so committed to do it. E e even once I had bought an Akai S950, which was like two months wages for me, to, 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 to use this thing was just a nightmare. You know, I guess when I started, if you were dyslexic, you've got no chance. Whereas now, you don't need to be able to read all this code and stuff. So it just means that more people can make music. And uh, I think that's a, a great thing. I don't know what the question was, but that's the answer. That was the answer we were looking for. <laughs> So that's it. I hope you enjoyed getting a glimpse into my creative process and seeing the software that I use and uh, hearing a little bit about my thought process. The big thing to remember is when I first started, you needed to have loads of money or loads of contacts. It was really, really hard. Now all you need is a laptop, a pair of headphones and a great idea. So what are you waiting for? Go and do your thing. Super sharp shooter, shooting shots.